seated. Question number 41. The Honorable Karekotora, you put the question. Thank you. Question direct to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Faber, I see you, you are not the one who asked the question. So can, can you please listen? <laughs> so thank you, Honorable Kavikatora, for asking the question, and I will paraphrase it just to remind the House. The GIPF is an institution tasked with the administration of government employees' pension pension funds so that on retirement they will have a decent and dignified retirement life. In the past, GIPF has made some bad decisions and some of these decisions were politically motivated, that's now what we say, oh, Honorable Kavagotola, I say, and ended up in billions of dollars unaccounted for and eventually written off as uncollected debt. Those bad decisions had a detrimental effect on the growth of the fund. Um, we have recently learned from the media that GIPF is holding an investment in investment house blacklisted by Namfisa claiming that notwithstanding the blacklisting, the investment is safe and sure. End of the quote, because that's, um, those are the questions, they, that's the, the uh, preamble of um, Honorable Kavikotoro's question. Question number one, which investment house in this regard has been blacklisted and what were the reasons for blacklisting? Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, I wish to thank Honorable Kavikotora for raising this question. The investment house, and I, I will be very telegraphic in answering his question, the investment house in question is the ball of capital. I'm sure Honorable Kavikotora may have picked picked up this in the media, which was deregistered by NAMFISA due to the fact that it is not or it was not in compliance with regulations made under the Pension Funds Act, Act number 24 of 1956. The company was given an opportunity, Honorable Kavakotora, to make written representations to NAMFISA, the regulator, as to why it, is, it should not be deregistered for non-compliance. After assessing the representations of, um, of the fund manager, the regulator was satisfied that Boab of Capital failed to comply with the relevant regulation. The result, it was decided to proceed to deregister Boab Capital as an unlisted fund manager in terms of Regulation 34, Sub 1B, with immediate effect. A public notice was published in local newspapers informing the public of the deregistration of Bob Capital as an unlisted fund manager and inviting the public to submit any claims against Bob Capital. That's the answer to question one. Question two. Who are the owners of the blacklisted company? I wish to inform the honorable member in the house that this subject unfortunately is still under subjudicate as the company is appealing, I believe, the decision of NAMFISA in this regard. And, and, the, and the, the matter is said to be heard at the appeal board in due course. Um, given this situation, it will be too premature to announce the names of the administrator of the fund, but, but I wish to advise Honorable Kavikotora to consult the public sources, because the name of the company is known. Um, so these companies are registered, are registered through by BIPA, so I think you can get the, the, the details from BIPA. And also the website, so Ms. Honorable Kavikotora, can you do a bit of research, please? and uh, get this information, it's public information. <laughs> Thank you, third question. Why is the GIPF management holding 
investment in a blacklisted company and what measure have they put in place to mitigate the risk? Honorable Saida, please listen. GIPF has taken necessary measures to safeguard the security of its funds. That was managed by this administrator. Now, this fund manager is just a fund manager who, is, who was managing the, the money. Now, and it doesn't mean that the money is with the fund manager. It's just you are given money to, to invest in specific companies. So, so this includes, this is what the GIP has done. This includes appointing new board of directors for the fund. Yeah, so there is now a new board there that is managing the fund. Um, yes, the former board has resigned before, before the fund administrator was, um, was, was deregistered. Now, you need to understand this. Maybe let me try to clarify it a little bit. So if you want to invest the unlisted portion of, um, of the pension fund, there are two things that need to happen. There is a, 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 a fund that has to be established and, and be um, established in terms of the law. But there should also be a fund manager, the, the administrator, the person who is going to take decisions as to where money is going to be invested. So who the, the, the entity that has been deregistered is the manager. Yeah, the fund is still there. So it, it will keep on receiving funds from, of course, the returns from the investments where the money has been invested. But also if GIF still wants to invest through that vehicle, the fund will still be there. So there is now a new board to manage that fund. The fund manager is no longer there. So the, that board will have to either do the management themselves or they will have to find, but I believe they will have to find another administrator to manage the fund. So the new board will ensure that the investee companies, because this money are invested in different companies, yeah, and these companies have got potential to um, improve the industrial base of Namibia. I believe some of these companies are, um, have got potential to grow and become big companies. And, 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 and therefore, this investment must be safeguard, safeguarded, and therefore the board, the new board is there to ensure that the, the funds invested in the investee company um, are safeguarded and, and, and therefore nurtured in, in a way that th these companies will realize their full potential will help Namibia becoming an industrial, industrialized country, and also the pension and the pensioners will, will benefit from that because they will, their pensions will grow. So, and including uh, Honorable Kavikotora's pension, <laughs> also including Honorable Sayed's pension. Uh, oh, he doesn't have one. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, the one which is coming. So question number two, what are your views as the custodian minister knowing that GIPF is keeping an investment in a blacklisted company, contrary to the watchdog, um, Namfisa's opinion, as I have mentioned above, Honorable Kavikotora, GIPF, both GIPF and Namfisa have taken um, sufficient action to ensure that, the, to ensure that the, the funds under the management of, the, of this fund is safe and secure. And therefore, there is no need for the Minister of Finance to take any additional measures. The competent authority in this regard is Namfisa. Yeah, and they, I believe they have done what they, they ought to have done. Uh, the Minister of Finance is not expected to do anything in this regard at this stage because the funds are safe. Last question, as a custodian ministry, what action, if any, do you intend to take against the ITF? Uh, I think the previous question and the previous answer will address this question. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speak one. Wait, wait for the mic. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. A very quick one. Maybe it's just testing my understanding. Honorable Minister of Finance, I thought you said the, the, the investment company went to rectify 
the problems that were identified by NAMFISA that have led to the blacklisting. But subsequent to that, NAMFISA was also not satisfied. Is that what you said? So basically, as far as NAMFISA is concerned, the, the, the mitigating circumstances were not satisfactory to basically uh, bring the, the investment company back to normal. Now, you are saying that both NAMFISA and the GIPF are satisfied with the mitigating circumstances that has been put in place. That's what I don't understand, because the reason why NAMFISA has blacklisted, and NAMFISA blacklisting still remains when it comes to that, 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 that investment house. Now you are saying NAMFISA is satisfied. How can they be satisfied and still continue? blacklisting that company. So that, that is perhaps just a follow-up question. Thank you very much. Minister? <clears throat> Thank you for the follow-up, Honorable Kavikotora. Let me apologize if I was not very clear. Um, there are two entities here. There is a fund, which is a legal entity on its own. There is an administrator of that fund. The entity which is, reg which is, which is, being, which is deregistered is the administrator, which went to Namfisa to appeal. Yeah? So, because the, the administrator, the manager of that fund was deregistered. They went to Namfisa to appeal. Namfisa listened. He said, no. We don't agree with your representation. We'll go ahead and we'll proceed to deregister you. So if that's the administrator. Yeah? Now, there's an, a, 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 the fund itself, the vehicle where, which is investing the money, which, is, which, is, which has got its own board. You have the administrator, the fund manager. You have the, the fund with its own board, yeah, which makes decisions as to how the money should be invested. The administrator is course, the distributor of the money, where the money should go, the, the of office, running the office part, but the decision making is the entity which has got its own board. Yeah, that entity is still there. Yeah, and as I was saying, it has got a new board now, because the previous board also resigned. So it has got a new board, it's still investing in those companies where the money was invested <coughs> before. So, the distinction we have to make is that there is a, an administrator who has been deregistered. The ASA fund, which, is, which continues to be the vehicle through which the GRPF money is, in, is invested. That, uh, that entity has got a new board now, and they are continuing with their, with, with their operations of investing this money and safeguarding the investment of GIPF. I hope I, I made that clear. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Question number 42. Honorable Ohab is not in the house. To put the question? Thank you. Thank you very much. And the question is directed to the Minister of Works and Transport. Honorable John Mujorwa, you have the floor. <coughs> Thank you very much, Comrade Speaker, for giving me this opportunity to respond to the questions posed by the Honorable Ohap, President of the United Democratic Front. And I'm also happy that Honorable Van den Yever has put the question on his behalf. Maybe you will be the next president of UDF. <laughs> on a lighter note. <laughs> ah, he will deserve you. <coughs> Comrade Speaker, uh, on a serious note, I mean this house should not always be tense. Now, this particular question, Comrade Speaker, should be responded as follows. It is true 
that the meeting that is being referred to in this question no 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 let's concentrate on listening uh, uh, Comrade Speaker, Honorable Sekbe, please. No, 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 no. Let's Listen to the presiding the officer there. This particular meeting that is being referred to in this question did indeed take place in this city of Yamasukro. For those whose geography is fading, I would like to say that Yamasukro is a city in the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. It is a city that was so promoted by the, the former president of a country that was known as Jair. It is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. So the meeting did take place there, it's true. Furthermore, it is also true that at that meeting, that decision was taken for the various member states of the African Union to sign the solemn declaration or commitment with regard to the single African aviation transport market in 1999. Question number two. Namibia has not yet fully implemented the Yamasukro decision. However, and this is good news, we are in the very, very final phase of implementing the Yamasukro de decision. It is also very important to note, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, that committing to instruments of treaties necessarily requires extensive consultations. In our case, when that decision was taken, we said, before we sign, we are going back home to consult the various stakeholders in this particular sector, which we did last year. And now at this juncture, Comrade Speaker, as we are answering this question, I'm happy to inform this Honorable House that Namibia is nearing the finalization of what has been a lengthy process in the practical implementation of the Yamasukro decision. Now, what is it that we are anticipating as a country to benefit? One, improved airline connectivity, shorter travel time, new routes and frequencies, lower fares, air traffic growth, increased tourism, increased trade, inward investment, partners, alliances, ventures, code share, major interlines. Now, in respect of the next question on the order paper, that is now the question talking about SADC safety aviation that only four other countries have signed. I would like to comment on the position of our country as follows. This is so because each SADC member state is first a sovereign state, as we all know, before being a member of SADC, and therefore would have their individual positions and reasons why they did not sign. In our case, as I've said, it was just a question of first affording ourselves the opportunity to consult widely at home here, which we did last year. As far as Namibia is concerned, we have now signed the solemn declaration in the meantime, last year already, and such instruments have already been deposited 
at the African Union Commission in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, by Namibia early this year, 2020. We have done so now. What is now left for us, and this is a process again, is to ensure the conclusion of this whole process, and I think before 2020 we will do that, which is the signing now of the Memorandum of Implementation with the African Civil Aviation Commission based in Dakar, Senegal. Now, once we have signed, and I think maybe our ambassador has already done so, I will come to that. Once we have signed now, then the full operationalization of the SAATM will come into force. But may I also inform the honorable members that at its meeting, which was held on the 22nd of September 2020, the Cabinet of the Republic of Namibia took the decision authorizing our ambassador in Senegal to sign the Memorandum of Implementation with the Civil Aviation Commission at its headquarters in Dakar, Senegal. Also at that meeting, I think it is necessary, at the Cabinet meeting, we were given some additional responsibilities as a ministry to do, namely to determine the financial implications and funding modalities of the proposed focal persons and other related expenditure in the implementation process of the Yamasukro decision. And also we were directed to consider hosting a workshop for all relevant stakeholders to develop the SAATM implementation strategy in order to ensure that Namibia derives optimal benefits in the area of tourism, trade and investment, and that the strategy also that we will develop must take cognizance of all international agreements pertaining to most favored nation status and economic partnership agreements. I am able to inform the Honorable House and through this Honorable House, Honorable Speaker, the entire public, that I have already given directives to our officials in the ministry to exactly deal with these additional cabinet resolutions, and we hope early next year we'll be able to make a report to the cabinet and also later to this particular house, which is the National Assembly of Namibia. I so move, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll continue. Question number 44. The Honorable Jindai, you put the question. Thank, thank you. The question is directed to the Minister of Justice. Honorable Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, and thank you very much, Honorable Elma Jane Dienda, for asking the question. Honorable Speaker, the question relates to the Criminal Asset Recovery Fund in in the office of the Attorney General, which also relates to the Prosecutor General's office. Honorable Speaker, there are, there are no staff members employed by the Criminal Asset Recovery Fund in the office of the Attorney General. The fund is administered by the Criminal Assets Recovery Committee that is established in terms of Section 77 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 9 of 2004. The members of the committee include the Minister of Justice, who is also the chairperson of the committee, the Minister of Home Affairs, Immigration, Safety and Security, the Minister of Finance and the Attorney General. The Minister of Justice is also empowered under Section 72, 77.2e of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 2004 to designate not more than seven persons, if necessary, 
to deliberate on any relevant matter that is before the committee. Currently, these two members, these two additional members, are the Prosecutor General and the Inspector General. The fund is established in terms of Section 74 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 2004 to be used by Cabinet after considering the recommendations of the Criminal Assets Recovery Committee for three purposes in terms of Section 76 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act of 2004. Firstly, the fund is established to allocate money and property belonging to the fund to specific law enforcement agencies. Secondly, to allocate money and property belonging to the fund to any institution, organization, or fund that has the object of rendering assistance in any manner to witnesses, including protected witnesses and victims of crime contemplated under Section 81C of the Act. And lastly, to administer the fund. And, and the fund includes the monetary and other assets of the fund. The Minister of Justice is required in terms of Section 2 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 2004, in consultation with the Minister of Finance, to designate a staff member to be the accounting officer of the fund. At present, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, the Minister has designated the Executive Director of the Ministry of Justice to be the accounting officer of the fund. The accounting officer is accountable to the Criminal Assets Recovery Committee and also coordinates the meetings of the committee and the execution of the decisions of the committee. Second question. According to the Auditor General's report for the financial year March 28, 2018, nine vehicles were declared forfeited to the state by the Criminal Assets Recovery Fund. To answer Honorable Dienda, Honorable Dienda is correct that paragraph 1.4.1 1. of the report of the Auditor General on the accounts of the fund for the financial year ended on 31 March 2018. Report that the audit found, reports that, and I quote, the audit found that upon finalization of a case, POCA 03-2017, there were nine vehicles forfeited to the state, and that the audit found that these vehicles were not, not yet seized by the defendant. Honorable Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to explain that the execution of the preservation of property order that was issued by the High Court in the case of INRE ex parte Prosecutor General with case number POCA 03-2017 could not be traced for the reasons that are outlined below. During 2018, the Namibian police, together with the Commercial Crime Unit, established the Asset Management Division to take care of property subject to preservation of property orders and to deal with properties that are forfeited to the state. The Asset Management Unit of Nampol established the following in respect of this particular case. Firstly, at the time when the preservation order was applied for, the vehicles were not in possession of Nampol. And according to records provided by the Namibia Traffic Information System, NATIS, the vehicles were still owned by the suspect. However, it eventually surfaced that the ownership of one of the vehicles, the Dodge with license number N181742W, was actually changed prior to obtaining the preservation order. Secondly, when the preservation order was subsequently issued, Natas was not served with a copy of the preservation order and hence allowed the change of ownership of the vehicles forming part of the court order. This is why the asset management unit 
later discovered that the ownership of the Honda was license number N4452 KM, the Nissan was license number N58654W, the Mercedes Benz was license number N13366W, and the Volkswagen panel van was license number N186359 W were changed after the preservation of property order was obtained. At present, there is only one vehicle. The Volkswagen with license number Flitterna that remains vested in Namibia Travel Consultancy CC, which is the company owned by the suspect in the case. Section 82.9 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 2004 makes it an offense to refuse or to fail to comply with the preservation of property order or a forfeiture of property order. This is why NAMPOL was consequently instructed by the prosecution to open a criminal investigation against the owner of Namibia Travels Consultant CC regarding the dealing of the properties in a manner that contravenes the preservation of property order. Honorable Speaker, in order to avoid similar occurrences in the future, the following measures have now been put in place to ensure that in cases where properties are subject to a preservation order but are not yet under the custody of NAMPO, that all orders concerning vehicles should be served on the roads authority and specifically on NATIS, and further that the roads authority should be made aware that if they process a change of ownership whilst there is a preservation of property order or a forfeiture order in place, then they can be prosecuted in terms of Section 89.2 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 2004. Lastly, there were other vehicles and houses forfeited to the fund in terms of various court orders. I have attached an inventory of the property of the fund to my response of the questions posed by Honorable Dienda, setting out the descriptions of these properties. The committee has directed that the court appoint staff members in accordance with Section 93 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act to sell the properties in question and to pay the proceeds thereof into the fund. The auctioning of the vehicles remains a challenge as the court orders direct that the vehicles be sold at market value, which has, which has proven difficult during the auctions conducted. Very few of the vehicles are sold on auction and the committee recommended to cabinet, which recommendation was approved, that some of these vehicles instead be allocated for use by law enforcement agencies. In addition to the above, it is important to mention that there were two houses approved to be handed over to the Namibian Police Family Protection Units to be used as shelters. The instructions for the transfer of these immovable properties were given to the government attorney and is underway whilst all vehicles have now been transferred to the fund. On the third question, Honorable Speaker, the audit report also found that vehicles that await to be sold are standing parked in an open area at the government garage. Section 68 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 2004 requires the staff member or the curator bonis appointed in terms of the forfeiture order to deliver property or money forfeited to the fund or to dispose of property forfeited by sale or any other means and deposit the proceeds into the, into the fund. None of the vehicles of the fund are parked at government garage. All vehicles are parked at the Ministry of Works Maintenance Division. The vehicles parked there are mostly parked under shading and the older vehicles are parked in the sun due to a lack of space. This is the best option we currently have for storage of the vehicles and we are looking at other options. The accounting officer has constituted an asset management committee consisting of officials from safety and security justice and the Prosecutor General who came up with an asset management manual 
to deal particularly with these concerns. Where are the latest fin annual financial statements from this office? Honorable Speaker, Section 76.1 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 2004 directs that Cabinet, after considering the recommendations of the committee, may utilize money in the fund to allocate money and property belonging to the fund to specific law enforcement agencies or to allocate money and property belonging to the fund to any institution, organization or fund that is the object of rendering assistance in any manner to witnesses, including protected witnesses and victims of crime contemplated in Section 81C of the Act, or to administer the fund. When the committee allocates funds to an institution, organization, or the fund, that institution, fund, or organization must appoint an accounting officer. The Auditor General must then audit the books of accounts, accounting statements, financial statements, and financial management of each law enforcement agency, each institution or fund to which money or property belonging to the fund have been allocated. The Auditor General must in turn submit a copy of the report in the audit to the committee. The audited financial statements for the period ending 31 March 2019 were submitted to the Auditor General for auditing and audit findings were responded to. The next financial statements for the period ending 31 March 2020 are due for submission in October 2020. The committee meets on a quarterly basis and the last meeting took place on 12 August 2020. The committee members have provided an update on the status of the fund as well as the activities on the fund bank accounts that are outlined in the report attached to my response to Honorable Dienda's questions. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much for that understanding. We move on to Honorable Fritz. You put the question. Thank you very much. The question is directed to the Minister of Mines and Energy. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, the Deputy Minister will take the question. Thank you. Deputy Minister, you are ready. I can see you have the floor. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, allow me to thank Honorable Isaac Fritz for the question. And without repeating the said question, I would like to respond as follows. On the first question, the government of Namibia, through the Ministry of Mines and Energy, runs a national rural electrification program with the primary objective of promoting and facilitating the socio-economic development of rural areas. The ministry is responsible for the implementation of the program. However, the regional councils are fully responsible for the prioritization of localities to be considered for electrification in their respective regions each financial year. In order to maximize the impact and reach as many villages, localities in the shortest possible time, the Ministry follows the 2010 Rural Electrification Distribution Master Plan methodology of prioritizing the electrification of those villages and localities that have unelectrified public institutions such as schools, clinics, police stations, etc. <coughs> By bringing the lines to these communities, it allows the various regional electricity distributors, as we call them REDS, regional and local authority councils, to connect households at a reduced cost because the major part of the line has already been provided and funded for by the government. 
which is an optimum way to reach as many communities as possible. Honorable Speaker, Snaifontein and Itabises are among a number of settlements that the Ministry managed to bring electricity supply infrastructures to. There are many more unelectrified localities that the Ministry is trying to reach. On the second question, Honorable Speaker, it is true that the Minister of Mines and Energy initiated a project to electrify Snaifontein in 2016. The project was split in two phases. Phase one, which is completed, installed the low voltage reticulation infrastructure, that is the poles, electrical lines, and meters in all eligible households and institutions at the time. Phase two is meant to install the medium voltage network to Snaifontein so as to connect the households and institutions to the national grid. The tender for this project was advertised in 2018 and the contractor was appointed in 2019. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond the Ministry's control, the contract was cancelled and will be re-advertised again this month before the end of October 2020. Usually it takes three to six months to appoint a contractor and approximately seven months for construction. Therefore, we expect Snaifontein to be electrified in the last quarter of 2021. On the third question, Honorable Speaker, it is not possible to extend the electricity from Nekatal Dam because there's already a provision made for connecting Snaifontein. Nampawa is executing this project on behalf of the Ministry. The planning and design of the line is already done and we expect it to be completed by next year, as alluded to earlier. Honorable Speaker, on the fourth question, which is the last one, on the seven households that are not electrified in Itabises. The Ministry brought electricity to Itabises in 2010 before the approval of the 2010 Rural Electrification Distribution Master Plan and connected all the houses and institutions it could at the time. The Ministry hands the electrification assets over <coughs> to their heads regional or local authority councils that are responsible for the provision of services. And in this case, we are talking about the current regional council. All the new structures, such as households and institutions that are erected after the ministry project is completed or where for any reason not connected, it becomes the responsibility of the regional council. <coughs> the additional seven houses were constructed after the ministry project was completed and as such are now to be electrified through the current regional council. The council confirmed that it has received applications from these households. It is now a matter of when the council can source the funding to complete the electrification of the additional houses in Itabises. I thank Honorable 
phrase once again for the question, and I just hope I have answered it to his ultimate satisfaction. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Honorable Speaker. Just, just while we are there, can I remind the honorable members, please, your guard must be up. Cover your face according to the regulation. Very important for our own protection. Honorable face. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I thank the Deputy Minister for, the Honorable Deputy Minister for the reply. But I, I tend to disagree with the information that has been given now, that the families of those seven houses were constructed after the, the electricity was provided. That is definitely not the case. Um, these people, these seven households, were long before even before some of the other households were in its services, already settled there. So, um, I, I just think Thanks. that there were some other ulterior motives that were used to punish these people. And it's now, it's now more than 10 years that they are not with electricity. In a settlement, where we only have we only have 33 households. We only have 33 households. Let me and let me let me get the deputy minister to respond. Please, <laughs> deputy minister, you want to add? Thank you, honourable speaker. Uh, there is there is no motive, and as I have indicated earlier. According to the information, these houses were built after the ministry's project was completed. And as I have also alluded to, that the regional council have received applications for the electrification of these houses, and they are going to be electrified as per the determination of the regional council of Karak. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Speaker. Let's move on. Let's move on. Question number 46, the Honorable Hungary. You put the question. The Honorable Member. Do you put the question? Thank you very much. And the question is directed, well, as far as I know, the Honorable Minister is not in the House anyway, but the question stands over. We move on to question number 47. The question is from Dinda. You put the question. And the question is directed to the Honorable Minister of Works and Transport, Honorable John Mutorwa. You have the floor. Thank you once again, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor to respond to the very important questions that the Honorable Dienda has posed. The Honorable Dienda's preamble. <laughs> no? Why are you excited? The Honorable Dienda's preamble, really, and I mean it, does to a very large extent articulate the contextual background against which the questions that she posed will be responded to. And I must also say that I appreciate the fact that she raised these questions which require nothing else but factual responses. It's not a political thing. Now, in view of the importance of
the subject matter, which subject matter is the government of the Republic of Namibia's Noble Housing Alienation Scheme of the non-assigned government houses. I deem it, Honorable Speaker, as my public responsibility and duty as the current minister entrusted with the overall accountability and responsibility, obviously as per Article 40E, and I want the Honorable Members to read that article, which obliges a minister to attend meetings of the National Assembly and to be available for the, for the purposes of any queries and debates pertaining to legitimacy, wisdom, effectiveness, and direction of government policy. And that is in that context that I am going to respond to this question. And the honorable members this side, I think we are succeeding all the time in adhering to this provision by responding to questions that are put to us as a government. Now, honorable speaker, let me just broadly, before coming to the specific question, articulate the policy environment in which the government took those decisions long time ago. One, cabinet by decision number 23, which was taken on the 23rd of August 1998, and also a decision that was taken on the 1st of July 2008. And there was another one that was taken on the 22nd of February 2000. And then the other one that was taken on the 20th of April 1999. It was resolved that some non-assigned government houses should be alienated to the sitting tenants who are government employees under specific modalities, rules, and regulations. This alienation scheme was expected to run for a period of three to five years, which by implication means that not all houses will be alienated at the same time, but rather be gradually sold off. In addition, honorable speaker and honorable members, the government of the Republic of Namibia reserves the right to exclude certain properties from the alienation scheme which means that not all the houses will be alienated. The following criteria were used to determine the houses to be sold or not to be sold. One, houses that are located in prime business areas, zoned for businesses and or industrial development, within the central business district of a town or city would not be alienated. Two, houses that are located on premises of existing functional government facilities such as hospitals, schools, military bases, etc. will not be alienated. Three, houses that are located in prime business areas or on functional premises, but which have been identified by the line ministries, agencies, or offices of the government as assigned houses for use to accommodate 
advisors, consultants, or staff that are transferred from one region to the other will also be excluded from this scheme. And then lastly, any other property which may be considered for further government use would be excluded from this scheme. Now, although this noble government decision was largely appreciated by most employees, it would appear to have disadvantaged some employees in the sense that the houses that they have been occupying were excluded from the alienation scheme as they were in business designated municipal areas. The affected employees, therefore, made their cases heard by making numerous verbal and written presentation to the Ministry of Works and Transport and also met with the ministers starting from 2008, even up to now, to make their case. While the affected employees do not dispute the logic of not selling the set houses for residential purposes, they feel that, and I think they've got a case, that just like their colleagues who benefited from the scheme, they also rightfully deserve the same consideration of buying the houses they currently occupy, and I want to emphasize at the 23 market value and discounted prices as per the specific cabinet decision taken. Now, in view of the above, Cabinet, by its decision that was taken on the 28th of May 2009, amended its earlier decision of 1998 on the alienation of government houses in order to address the plight of those civil servants excluded by the alienation process. Prior to the amendment of its earlier decision, Cabinet in 2008 opined that it is just reasonable that the base date for open market values should be restricted within this period and therefore not exceed August 2003. And it is clear that cabinet decision was based on the fact that the alienation exercise was intended to be completed within four to five years and that all valuations should have been completed and offers could have been made to the sitting tenants within the time frame. Now, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, although Cabinet rescinded its earlier decision, offers could not be made to the sitting tenants or civil servants of the above mentioned houses because the properties or houses they occupy are not freestanding houses, but they are situated on a block of Erven, Erf number 4843, which is now raised, rightly so, in these questions, and Erf number 4845 here in Vintuk. Now, the only way to address the issue was to appoint town planners to follow all statutory procedures in terms of town planning for the subdivision of the said block ervens into individual plots. Town planners were appointed by the Minister of Works and Transport but the process and the process of obtaining the necessary approvals, the subdivisions and the surveys was only concluded last year, 2019. Furthermore, the lengthy processes on the part of the ministry in finalizing this, the required statutory approvals 
surveys and subdivisions in this matter, surely and admittedly so, did lead to the delay in issuing the purchase offers to the sitting tenants. Had it not been due to the delay on the part of the ministry, and the delay was justified because they had to do a proper job in evaluation and subdivision. The sitting tenants would have purchased their houses if it was not for this delay. They would have purchased the houses at the 2003 open market value and discounted prices within the given time frame. Taking into account all this, make offers to the sitting tenants, delays, the ministry made offers to the following tenants based on the base date as per the aforesaid <coughs> cabinet decision of 2009 and per, as per the evaluation made by the Ministry of Agriculture through the Velia General through their letter now, which came on the 8th of October, giving new values to those houses. And this is the source of the, maybe you can call it justifiable complaints. And we are talking here about more or less 14 urban and houses. And I have met people in my office there, you look into their faces, very disappointed, but we keep on explaining to them that we just have to follow the law. And if a decision in a cabinet is to be, the amendment to a cabinet decision is to be taken, we have to go back to cabinet, for cabinet to reconsider its decision and then do the appropriate, you know, new decision. But coming to this, that was just the background, very, very comprehensive background, which I think because it is necessary, even today, as I came here, I have a letter here from a tenant in Kietman Swap writing to me exactly to complain. It's not the only one. There are many coming. Therefore, the specific responses now to these questions, Honorable Dienda, that I got now from the experts who are dealing with this, is that the tenants on R48 Four, three could not be given offers due to the issue of access servitude on one of the semi-detached house. The access servitude was only approved by the township board last year, 2019. In the meantime, in the meantime, there was a report from the Auditor General that came highlighting the concern that the 2003 market values of houses sold, those that qualified, not on this earth, they bought their houses at the market value of 2003. But this report from the Auditor General, which we cannot ignore, that came last year, pointed out that that value of 2003 was too low, and therefore it was basically a loss to the state. Yeah, the market value. An instruction from the Ministry of Finance as the custodian of the assets instead of uh, in, 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 in accordance with the State Finance Act was that we as a ministry must approach the value general to review all the valuations and base them on the present market values that was sent in May 2018. However, the Ministry of Land Reform, and rightly so, I think, they refused to review the values because they are still bound by the 1st of July 2008 cabinet decision that restricted them to a base date for market values of 2003. The Auditor General's office noted the significant low prices of government properties sold as a concern and advised the Minister of Works to submit to submit to submit 
Honorable Seibert, to submit the issues to the Cabinet to obtain a new revised directives and decisions on the base year for valuation for the remaining properties after the subdivision now, which are to be sold. Most, if not all, government urban as well as the houses are of course huge in terms of size, even though you can say the structure itself dilapidated, but the value and the land is quite very valuable. Now, listen to this one now. In answer to what has the ministry done now to rectify this problem, we approached cabinet, which are, we approached cabinet this year, and in actual fact, cabinet, after a very comprehensive deliberation of this issue, and I see the right honorable prime minister is here the chair of the deliberative cabinet meeting, we deliberated on this thing on the 3rd of March this year. And after a lengthy deliberation, a decision was taken to allow the Minister of Works and Transport to alienate government houses using the 2010 open market values for all the remaining houses. But even that one, it means that we cannot just be on the basis of the cabinet decision. The, the valuators are still going around in the regions to do the valuation. Now, the valuations for Vintuk, Okahanja, and Riobot have been completed. But there are still other regions, because these houses are all over in all the regions. Now, including Okakarar, of course. Sitting tenants will receive the new offers in October this year. That's now according to the 2010. I'm humbly requesting, and I'm using this platform, Comrade Speaker, because I know this, this particular issue, there are many people affected, but I think government is doing whatever it does so that when the offers are made, that we make sure that these offers are reasonable, because the policy intentions of government, which I think was noble, was to ensure that at least the government employees would be able to afford some kind of a house. Many of these people who are now complaining, really, you look in the face, are people who, if they retire, they will not be able to get, whether it is a loan from the bank or the pension will not allow them, you know, to, to afford to buy a house on the open market. And this government, our government, all of us, our government, is very understanding as far as that matter is concerned. But we also, as government, you see, we have in the Constitution that our democracy, or our state is based on democracy, the rule of law, and justice for all particularly the issue of the rule of law. Yes, you can be 100% correct in terms of applying the law, but it must be balanced against the issue of justice or fairness. And this government is definitely seized with that matter, and hopefully we will get out of there so that at least whenever we sell, that both we have complied with the rule of law, but also with the issue of justice and fairness. And that we are now pursuing through this cabinet decision of the 3rd of March 2020. But it's also moving slow because we must allow the valuators to do their work before you give an offer. And even the deeds of sale, these are legal documents where you are not sure you have to consult. Minister of Finance for them to give what, what you call it the Treasury authorization. Auditor General must also say and satisfy and say, yes, the date of sale, all these agreements are in place. And there we plead for an understanding. But once again, finally, Honorable Dienda, I think if there are any other questions related to the specific act that you have followed, we are ready in the ministry, again, to provide the necessary information as to how this matter has been dealt with.
but I try to the best of my ability in fulfillment of my responsibility in the Constitution to give this information to the general public. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Honorable Dinda, you... Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Mutora, just to comment. The one is that please keep me updated regarding this issue, number one. Number two, these women, most of them are 55 years old, so they will go into retirement after five years. So as you said, they will not be able to afford these houses if this delay will continue as it is now. So I'm asking you and the right Honorable Prime Minister, Please have mercy on these women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Honorable Dienda, you are right, but don't assume. I quoted to you that this matter went to Cabinet this year, and Cabinet did consider and made a decision, which we are now implementing. So we are mindful, and I told you, and you are 100% correct, I have met Many of the people involved were people who have been working various offices, ministries, over a long period of time. And you are right. And we are going to handle this issue accordingly. Sympathetically, but also not forgetting the rule of law and justice for all. We'll do that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. With that understanding, keep hope alive. Question number 48, the Honorable Mike Kavikotora, you put the question. Thank you. The question is directed to the Minister of Urban and Rural Development. The Deputy Minister is here. You have the floor. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. <coughs> I want to thank Honorable Mike Kavikotora for putting the question to us. <coughs> and I will answer him as follows. I will go straight into the answers. Since 2014-15 financial year, the government budgeted 1,365,896,888 Namibian dollars for the construction and completion of the 3,954 commenced but not completed houses under the Mass Housing Development Program. The aforementioned budget was split as follows. 266 million Namibian dollars for the 2014-15 financial year. 607 million Namibian dollars for the 2015-16 financial year. 148 million 577,039 Namibian dollars for the 2016-17 financial year, 110,633,079 Namibian dollars for the 2017-18 financial year, 86,483,762 Namibian dollars for the 2018-19 financial year, 100 million Namibian dollars for the 2019-20 financial year. 47 million Namibian dollars for the 2020-21 financial year. The number of houses completed to date is 3,073 houses and completed at the cost of 1,318,896,888 Namibian dollars. A total of 891 houses, 362 in Venduk, 505 in Swakopmund, and 24 in Apuo are yet to be completed, and procurement plans are underway to ensure completion of these houses. Question 2. The 300,000 housing backlog is reflecting a housing shortage distribute as follows. 240,000 in the low and ultra low income segment and the remaining 60,000 houses are estimated in the middle income category. In addition, I would like to inform the August House that the Ministry of Urban and Rural Development 
has engaged, the Namibia Standard Statistic Agency and has recently concluded a partnership agreement to develop the Namibia Housing Information System that is expected to be operational by the end of April 2021. In the future, housing statistics will be readily available online and will be updated together with the national census. Question three. Um, Honorable Kabekatora, there is currently no SADC benchmark percentage of GDP towards the housing sector. Number four. As I have responded earlier, there is no SADC benchmark percentage of GDP towards housing, and therefore this projection is not possible. However, the government recognized the need and the urgency for and to provide housing for its people, and through programs such as the Mass Housing Development Program, the aim is to clear the current backlog using the, the various sub-programs of the Mass Housing Development Program by the end of the year 2030. The five sub-programs are, as I say, once again, there is no static formula used by the government of Namibia on allocation of funds to sector ministries. The government only looks at individual requirements and the availability of resources, funds available in the pool after allocation to statutory funding loans and guarantees. As a result, thereof, no static formula is applied to the housing allocation. The member countries and Namibia in particular allocate funding to housing sector according to Vision 2030, targets and NDP goals, subject to the availability of funds. Next question. Yes, the SWAPU government have a national housing policy called the Namibian National Housing Policy, and this policy was approved by Cabinet and eventually this August House, in July 1991, it was reviewed by Cabinet, and eventually this August House, in <coughs> July 2009, these copies are available, and I have a copy here specifically for Honorable Mike. Uh, question six. Yes, the Namibia National Housing Policy has been in operation since its approval, in July 1991. All our outstanding programs such as Build Together program and recognition and the recognition and support given by to the people's housing process and community-based organizations emanates from and or is fully recognized in the Namibia National Housing Policy for support towards the contribution to affordable housing delivery in Namibia. I have question seven. I have already responded to this question by offering and making available copies of the Namibian National Housing Policy that was approved by Cabinet and eventually this August House in July 1991 and was again reviewed by Cabinet and eventually in this August House and approved eventually in this August House in July 2009. Question number eight. There are a number of alternative methodologies and technologies the government have introduced in the construction of its Habitat Research and Development Center. It is situated in Katatura. The entire center is constructed of alternative local, locally available materials such <coughs> as used tires, hydrofoam construction, and the paneling system, etc. Using alternative technologies such as dry, waterless sanitation, double paneling, hydrofoam systems, etc. I, I urge Honorable Kavigatora to visit this center. I'll accompany him. It's, a, <laughs> it's your product. Then we go together. And to look at the alternative construction methodologies material and technology used in the construction of the center in addition to also take a look at the private sector that the government has allowed to showcase their products for the interest of the public. During the mass housing development program, the government introduced the reinforced phone technology 
on one of its projects in Sokovmund. It was unfortunate the, tec the technology did not achieve to the desired quality of standard and the houses needed to be demolished. I, I really thank Honorable Mike Kapikatora for his interest in the housing sector. And as I discussed with him previously, he's more than welcome. We can take a trip together. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank, thank you, Honorable Kapikatora. This is something close to your heart. Continue to clap hands. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Honorable Speaker. I would like to thank the Honorable Deputy Minister for responding to my questions. I'm, I'm really grateful. You highlighted quite a number of uh, issues, and I'm, and I'm glad that you also, in a way, repudiated what was said yesterday, there, that um, we, are, we, are, we are winning the war in housing delivery, it was said uh, up there. Now, and I'm also glad that uh, you mentioned that the biggest backlog of 240,000 is in a low and ultra low segment of the housing market. I, I think that, that to me is where people have to clap hands yes. to acknowledge the fact that the government is failing in the most important yes. sectors of the housing sector. Yes. I, I, take, I take the Honorable Minister, I also agree that we spoke about this. I don't, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to say more. I don't want to say more because I really want to take that opportunity to come and see you and the Minister Thank you. of Housing so that we can actually sort of uh, Thank collab you. collaboratively, you must, you must stop Honorable no, 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 Tony Noyoma, no. collaboratively can, can look into this matter. The Habitat Research and Development Centre is my product. I'm the one who initiated that and I'm the one who put it there. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't, if Tony Nuyama does not agree, ask your Secretary General. She used to work for me. Thank you, thank you. Deputy Minister. Yeah. Order, order, order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I, I, I hear what you are saying, uh, Honorable Kapakotora, and uh, you, you take ownership of the project. But still, you are talking about failing. Yeah. Government has failed. I don't know. I don't know how, how, how I can see this because government government is really trying its level best with the funding available to see, and they have done a lot for this sector. But as the numbers indicate, you can also see the influx is 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 a lot into these specific areas. But nevertheless, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Kapakatora <laughs> and his interest in housing, promise he'll visit our ministry and we'll see what he has to say and we'll discuss with him. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on. Honorable Tenda, you put the question? Thank you. The question is directed to the Deputy Minister of Urban and Rural Development. You have the floor. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, again, and uh, I need to thank Honorable Dinda for posing this, this question that has really to do with bread and butter issues of people out there. And I will try my level best to answer on this question. Razak, I promise her, will give the answer today and it's here. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Dinda, for the question, and I will go straight into the answer. Honorable members, allow me to first of all make general comments on the issue of 
city of Winduk overcharging residents on their water bills as raised by the Honourable Member. The claim by Honourable Elma Dienda that the city of Winduk have been over the years overcharging residents on their water bills is too generic, thus creating a wrong impression to the public. Water bills are composed Okay, please continue. Thank you. Water bills are composed of two inputs, namely approved and gazetted tariffs, and actual uh, consumption as the readings obtained from each water meter, which are all verifiable. However, due to the nature of the operation and size of the customer base, exceptional cases do exist in which some residents from time to time raise concern on their high water bills, and most of the time, each case is unique and shall deal with accordingly. There are different factors resulting in high water bills to cause a concern, so some residents and all are described below. One, back charges. Back charges are caused by two main reasons. Absence of actual meter reading or zero consumption meter readings submitted. In, in most cases, customers complain when back charges covered a long period due to the actual readings which were not available for longer periods. When no readings are available on the billing date, City of Wendook bills customers interim charges based on estimated historical average and reverses all interim charges when the actual charges are obtained. 1.1. Back charges from absence of actual readings which result in interim charges. Inaccessibility, inaccessible meters due to locked gates for meters located inside properties. Shelf readers failing to submit actual readings. City meter readers not covering the whole population in a cycle. When actual readings are obtained, the actual consumption is then charged and interim reversed. The problem arises when the actual readings are higher than the historical average. In this case, the amount paid based on interim charges fails to totally offset the charges based on, based on actual readings. This sometimes happens when a water leak takes place or resident increase his or her consumption due to increase in family size or other example construction activities and so on. During the period when no actual readings were being charged, in cases where, where leaks have taken place, residents are entitled to rebate in accordance with Municipal's Water Managed Plan. 1.2. Back charges from zero consumption. Sometimes meters get stuck, resulting in zero actual consumption. When it is discovered, the meter is replaced and the client is back charged on their normal consumption, which is the lowest average of before or after the replacement. This too becomes a concern to residents when the back charges cover a long period since the meter was stuck for a long period without being discovered. Malfunctioning water meters. In some cases, a water meter might malfunction. Mm -hmm. A meter test will be requested and the test result outcome will be determined what need to be done on the client's account. When meter is found faulty, a resident is refunded the meter test free and is credited with excess charge, charges on water consumption. By three months average of the new meter. Number two, incorrect readings. It does happen from time to time that either our meter readers or the client provides incorrect readings. As soon as this is detected on our reports or the client's query, it is immediately rectified. Number three, drought tariff. As part of Central Water Management Plan, City of Windhoek have drought tariffs 
which encourage residents to reduce the water consumption during the drought season. Unfortunately, some households are normally late in responding to the City of Windex media campaign, thus a court of guard when the drought tariffs are implemented. In addition to some safeguards alluded about, recently the COS approved the establishment of a committee to look into how best the Municipal Council of Windex could mitigate the impact of high water bills resulting from factors given above. In general, the city has various channels which are open where residents may submit the complaints on high water bills. We therefore request Honorable Dienda to provide us with a list of details of residents that have been overcharged, of which Municipal Council has done nothing under the confinement of the existing regulations. Over the past two years, City of Windhoek has conducted a comprehensive pilot study to identify the most suitable technology available on prepaid water meters. These prepaid water meters will soon be rolled out, starting with pensioners, the vulnerable, as well as non-paying customers. Prepaid water meters will also be available to anyone who wishes to install such. Allow me, Honourable Members, to answer the following two questions for Honourable Dienda. The Ministry has been issuing directives each every year to local authority councils directing them not to increase tariffs, especially for domestic consumption. The directives are normally issued when there is no increase on tariffs by bulk utility, utility provider, for example, Nampower, Namwater, Noret, Senoret, and Erongoret. In order to ensure that the local authorities comply with these interventions, directors, we developed a check list which is assessed vigorously when the local authorities submit their budgets to the Minister for approval as provided for in the Local Authority Act. The local authorities are also requested to submit the tariffs to be charged during the specific financial year in order to be scrutinized and gazetted. This requirement is aimed at ensuring that the overcharging of residents is prevented. Question number two. Per periodic water reading and shelf reading as well as servicing of water meters regularly are introduced as means to ensure the reading of water consumption accurately. Some local authorities have also introduced digital meter reading, which is an advanced method to enhance accuracy, accurate reading, and avoid overcharging. I really thank Honorable Dienda for the question. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Dienda. <coughs> Honorable Speaker, I'm not satisfied because I took my own water bills to the municipality to ask them what is going on here. Myself, I went there. So ask Mr. Molekeng and Ms. whatever his name is, I was there three times complaining about my water bills. Even when I was away for one month and there was nobody at my house, the, uh, the, 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 the bill remains the same. My water meter reader is outside my yard. It is not inside. So they cannot say it is accurate or the gate was locked or what. It's nothing like that. It is just estimates every month, estimates, estimates, estimates. So somewhere, somehow, Honorable Speaker, something is wrong with our bills that we are getting. So I can prove to you, I, I can show you my house, it is outside, it is not inside. And three times I was there at the municipality's office with my own bill. Not even Honorable Nicol Smith complained to me, and a lot of people complained to me about their bills. So they are really messing up at the city of Bandung and all over the country. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Speaker, I, I, if I, I think I had the Deputy Minister that's inviting further details, and this is an opportunity for the two of you to get together so that the Deputy Minister can look into this. Do you want to come back? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, no, no, uh, Honorable Dienda. I, I don't think we must go for coffee. I think we must make this a case study. 
because the invitation is there to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much. <laughs> no, I think, I think obviously there are many people who have raised this issue, and I think we need to look into that. Yeah, that, that, that said and done, we have gone as far as possible. There are questions that are still outstanding. We'll take them up in good time when we come to next week. For now, uh, we are over the time. We will we'll come together again next week at the usual time. But I just want to remind members, next week is extremely important that we should be here. I hope we will come together in order to do justice to the uh, midterm budget review. The House stands until next week at the usual time. <laughs>